All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about making DrawPile run in the browser. Um, it's about bringing a desktop application into the web browser. This talk is primarily targeted at developers, so it gets pretty techy. Um, as was announced, I'm Kasten. You can find me on the internet as Ask Me About Loom. I hang out on Libera chat in like hash DrawPile, uh, hash Krita, or hash LGM if you want to find me there. And I maintain DrawPile. Um, I speak English and German, even though it might not sound like it. So if you're more comfortable in German, you can talk that to me. Um, French, not so much, but if you like speak Franglish to me, I can probably understand that as well. Um, the agenda for this talk, really quick, uh, what even is DrawPile? Very briefly, because I already kind of talked about it yesterday. Um, why would you want to bring it into the web browser? Or more generally, why would you want to bring a desktop application in general into the web browser? And the big topic, how do you do it? Um, and then also at the end, a section for questions, hopefully. Um, however, if you have any questions or notes or interests or corrections or I talk too fast or anything else along the way, you can interrupt me. Um, if it's something that needs to be moved to later or outside or whatever, we can do that. Um, I'll also be stopping at like strategic points and asking if you have any questions. So if you're shy, then uh, you can jump in there. So um, very briefly, again, what is DrawPile? If you watched the lightning talk yesterday, you don't need to pay attention now. Um, it's a drawing program. It looks like this on desktop. It looks like this on mobile. Um, it's not a regular drawing program. It's a collaborative drawing program. That means it has multiplayer, so you can draw online on the same canvas together. It's licensed under GPLv3, and it's primarily based on Qt widgets. So not like Qt Quick. Uh, it's the old style desktop Qt widgets. If you want to try it out, dropout.net LGM. Um, there's a session there that'll be up for like the duration of this event where you can like draw around and do stuff. Um, and you know, if you see me, ask me about it. I'll be here today, not tomorrow anymore, sadly, but I'll be happy to talk about the thing. So um, why would you want to bring a DrawPile or a desktop application into the browser? Well, for DrawPile, the obvious answer is collaboration. Um, if I can just send someone a web link and they can join right there in their web browser, then they're more likely to draw with me. Um, more generally, it massively lowers the barrier of entry for your application. So if users can try it out and use it in the browser, they're more likely to switch to it. They're more likely to get the desktop application instead of having the whole, oh, I have to install it first. Uh, maybe I'll just go elsewhere. Another reason that's less obvious is that you can run this stuff on uh, iPhones and iPads, which for a GPL application are, is not an option because the App Store says GPL applications can, can't go there and dealing with Apple isn't fun anyway. Um, so that's something that the web application will run fine in. Um, another thing that you kind of get out of it for free is that you get a progressive web app, or PWA. Um, this is basically you create like a manifest and um, a little JavaScript file, and then users can install your web application on their device, and they get it similar to like a regular application. They get a little icon uh, where they can click on and or tap on and it opens the application in like a full screen browser window without the UI on it. That's not, I wouldn't pretend like that that feels native, but like for an iPhone or an iPad where you don't get your application at all otherwise, it's more than nothing. And you basically get it free, as I said, you write two files. Okay, and so how do you bring a desktop application to the desktop? Well, uh, to the browser. The short answer is, well, okay, use WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a thing that lets you compile native code like C, C++, Rust, or whatever else to something that the browser can run pretty fast, like faster than JavaScript. Um, and the like classical way or the way that was intended for DrawPile to do it was, OK, we'll write a core engine that can doesn't have that many dependencies that we can compile um, to any platform easily. And then we'll write a desktop front end, and then we'll write a mobile front end, and then for the browser, I guess like we'll write like, some HTML thing with React or something, and then uh, no, that's not what happened. Instead, I just stuck the entire application into the browser. So this is Dropout running in the browser. It looks the same as on desktop, uses the same UI, which you know is obviously preferable from an amount of work perspective because we don't need to write three UIs. Um, and also users switching between the um, desktop application and the uh, web application don't have like they have feature parity. They don't need to learn a uh, different interface. Um, and so I would do it again if I had the choice. I wouldn't write a separate web front end for it. 
And like, yeah, the, on, on the mobile phone, it, you get them over UI, as you would expect. But like, there's a lot of things in a desktop application you wouldn't really expect to work in the browser. Or like, how would you even make that work in the browser? For one, like Qt widgets, as I said, like that's a desktop thing. Even having it running on mobile is kind of weird, but running it in the browser, maybe even on mobile, even weirder. Um, also, other dependencies, how do you get them to compile? Dropout doesn't have any exciting dependencies, but I can talk about how to get them building anyway. Um, OpenGL, how does that work in the browser? Um, files, browser is not known for being allowed to touch your file system, but you probably still want to save your drawings and open them, so how does that work? Um, sockets, Dropout's multiplayer, it wants sockets so that you can actually multiplay. Um, Multi-threading. If you ever use JavaScript, it ain't got threads. So how do you get threads in the browser? Um, which is relevant for like any CPU bound application. Um, pressure sensitive tablet pens. So like I've been asked about this already. How does that work in the browser? Does it work in the browser? Um, and lastly, Rust, that overhyped programming language. How do you get that into, uh, into the browser along with everything else? Spoilers. That didn't happen really with Dropout. I mean, I had it working. It didn't work. I'll talk about that later. Uh, it's not in there anymore. Right, so uh, Qt widgets, how do you get them building on uh, WebAssembly? Well, WebAssembly is just a platform for Qt, so uh, you kind of just cross compile it like to any other platform, mostly. So similar to compile it, cross compiling it to Windows or Mac OS, you just uh, deal with it as any other platform. So WebAssembly itself um, is a 32-bit little endian system, which on its own is not a desktop-like platform that your application could run on, um, which you actually use as mscripten. Um, mscripten is, on the one hand, a compiler, or like a compiler to chain. It has a C compiler, C++ compiler, or linker, and all that kind of guff. Um, the interesting part is that it has a runtime. And the runtime is a POSIX-like environment, so it gives you all the POSIX headers, gives you implementations for it that mostly make it look like a pretty regular platform that's like almost more normal than Windows. Um, and how you actually like get Qt working on WebAssembly, on Linux, because you know, I don't know what other systems do, it probably doesn't work there. And I only did it for Qt6, so if you need it on older versions, your mileage may vary. Um, step one, install mscripten. This is easy. It's just like a thing you download and install and then you source it into your browsers, uh, into your shell to, so that you get all the executables in your path. Then you build a host version of Qt. Um, I, you basically need to build Qt base and Qt shader tools. Maybe you can also figure out how to do it with just like your native packages. I couldn't because the Qt cross compile process expects everything to be under a single directory, which it isn't if it's like strewn all over your system. Maybe you're smarter than me and can figure that out. I didn't, I just built it myself. And then you cross compile Qt, which you just do by like passing um, the Qt configure call and you say uh, platform wasm mscripten and it goes and builds it. Um, one gotcha is asyncify um, to run async code, which you need in Qt, for example, for minor things like drag and drop to work at all. Um, you need to turn on asyncify. This is easy. You just pass device option Qt mscript and asyncify one to Qt's configure. Um, the reason I mentioned this is if you don't pass this, then you notice that stuff doesn't work, and then you scroll way down on the instructions page, and you notice, oh, I need to turn this on, and then you get to wait three hours for Qt to build again. So just turn this on. Next gotcha, you also got to turn on threads, dash feature thread to configure. Otherwise, wait three hours again. Ask me how I find out. Um, Okay, that gets you Qt. Um, pretty simple, actually, once you get through the gotchas. Um, other dependencies, well, if they um, use CMake, when you, after you build Qt, you get this executable bin CMake, uh, bin Qt CMake, which is basically a wrapper around CMake, which will set up the environment all properly for you to cross compile other applications. So you don't need to bother like setting your CMake tool chain or whatever, this does it for you. Um, and most dependencies that aren't crazy work with this. If you have like a, a GNU um, autoconf thing, you can just prefix it with mconfigure and then call configure. That does a similar thing, sets the environment properly um, for configure to work and make, same thing. You prefix it with mmake, run make, it sets the environment. Most dependencies that aren't insane just kind of work with this because the system is 
at least at compile time, like a normal POSIX system. So uh, as like, you haven't really found any dependency that doesn't work. I'm sure you can find stuff that doesn't run and if it uses like a weird build system, probably doesn't work right away, but I'm sure you can make it work because the platform isn't insane, unlike others. Your own application, well, in this case I'm assuming like, okay, you're also running on Qt, so um, you also just run bin uh, Qt CMake and then it sets the environment properly, it builds your application. Um, you probably need to hack around in your build scripts because you surely have hacks for every single operating system out there because they're all weird in another way, so you probably have to put like more ifs in there, but uh, this is how you build it. Um, one thing you need to pass to your compile option is dash pthread, so otherwise you don't get threads, and then your code won't link together because like Qt is built with pthreads, your code isn't, that doesn't fit together. Um, and another thing you want to pass is uh, as asyncify to the link options because otherwise you don't get drag and drop again. Um, and also some kind of optimization probably either OS or O3. Otherwise the WebAssembly code it spits out is ginormous like hundreds of megabytes and then passing uh, an optimization option makes it like 20. Um, this will spit out your application as like an app HTML, which will just run uh, your application in a full screen browser window basically. And it kind of gives you an application already. Like this is, it's not too crazy. There's lots of things you can do like during that setup to make it nicer, more checks, more like pretty up with logos and stuff. But these basics get you an application running in the browser. Any questions on that? Okay, yes. Um, what, what is the state you use for your build server? The, the, what was the, the code that you had to run to compile it? Um, yes, what the app HTML is like the front end. Then you get um, Qt has like a Qt loader thing that like loads your application um, for um, the application itself. That is a WebAssembly file. That's the .wasm file um, that has compiled code compiled to WebAssembly. And that's what gets loaded and run. But like you, as I said, like WebAssembly is just a 32-bit little Endian machine. So you need some scaffolding around it to actually get it working together. So it needs some JavaScript as well. And that's provided by Qt and you can extend it. Yes, I made it run on Android and I made it run in the browser. Yes. Okay. Uh, not properly. <laughs> Firefox just is missing some stuff uh, where I think Qt doesn't integrate with it properly. It works fine on Linux, but you don't get pen pressure, for example. You don't get what? Pen pressure. Pen pressure for um, testing your application. Yes. Yes, on, on Firefox, on Linux, you don't have pen pressure. If you use Chromium on Linux, it does. It's just a limitation of Firefox. Uh, but for, for the desktop one, um, pen pressure. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, Chromium on Linux also has pen pressure. All right. Uh, then moving on, um, OpenGL. This one is pretty simple. Um, the web browser supports WebGL. WebGL is OpenGL ES 2.0 with some additions. Um, web, there's also WebGL2, which is OpenGL ES 3.0. I haven't tried that because I didn't need it. Um, so if you use QOpenGL widget in uh, Qt, you get uh, normally working OpenGL. Well, sort of. Um, there's this Qt bug, which on Windows, um, well, your OpenGL widget works, but everything around it doesn't. Um, it just turns black. There's like some bug with a uniform cache or something. They haven't really figured out how to solve it, but they have like a patch that just turns off this cache and then it makes it work. Um, Dropout has a, a patch in its source tree that fixes that, that's applied to Qt and also applies some other stuff so that Qt doesn't spew infinite uh, OpenGL warnings. But um, other than that, mostly works out of the box. File handling, as I said, the browser can't access your file system. However, mscripten, um, being emulating a POSIX environment, gives you um, an in-memory file system called memfs that is mounted by default at the root. So slash is, exists and is a uh, in-memory file system. Um, you can just use the normal POSIX API to like create files and stuff, but they're only in memory. So when you close your application, they're gone. 
Um, if you need persistence, there's IDBFS. Um, IDBFS stands for um, indexed DB file system. Index DB is a thing in the browser that lets you store, quote, large amounts of data, whatever that means, until your user clears the cache or they're on an Apple device and it just blows away your files if it feels like it. Um, the way that works is you mount it under some mount point under your MemFS file system, then you call sync that loads the files from index DB into memory. And then later, if you want to persist them, you call sync again and it syn syncs them back into index DB. That means persistent writes are explicit, so you need to call that periodically or after every write or something, but that gives you persistence. Um, if you're using QT's Q Q settings, those also write to index DB automatically, you, so you know, don't need to fiddle with them in some way, they already work. Um, okay, but like that stuff won't give the user access to any files. Like they can't, they, it gives your application, like can write, can write configuration files and stuff like that, but it won't give you access to like the user file system. Um, if you want to open files from the user file system, Qt provides qfile.log get open file content, which you call, it browser opens uh, um, the native file browser, tells the user, hey, pick a file you want to upload, and then it calls your application back um, and it gives it the bytes and the name of the file. If your application expects it to be a file handle, you have to first write it to the in-memory file system, open the file handle, do stuff with it, and then like delete it later. Um, the opposite, if you want to write a file, there's save file content, um, opens uh, the native file dialog, says, hey, write this file, and you pass it the bytes you want to write and the suggested file name. Um, one gotcha there is that the browser will not open these dialogs unless there was user interaction recently. This is because you don't want web pages to like click jack you by like just opening a file dialog in your face and then oops, I actually accidentally uploaded a file. Um, this is probably not a problem with like opening files because you know that's instant, but when you want to save a file, your application probably takes some time to like produce that file and then at the end you can't open a file dialog. You have to open an intermediate dialog and tell the user, hey, your file is ready, click here to download it and then they click here and then you can actually show a dialog. Luckily, the error message in the browser is very clear. Like it just says, I didn't open a file dialog because you didn't like you did it too late. Um, it's very clear in the console, and that gives you files as far as like the browser can do them. You can't get direct access to the file system. Next up, sockets. Um, well, the browser has obviously some socket support. That's kind of its purpose. Um, Q Network Access Manager, the thing you use to do like get requests, put requests, post requests, etc. They work um, like you would expect. Um, you can just use them and they turn into AJAX requests behind your back. Um, if you want to use like bi-directional sockets, which Drawfile wants to do to like do real-time multiplayer, um, you can use Qt WebSockets that uses WebSockets as the name implies. This library exists on the desktop and mobile version as well. It's just like a wrapper around the TCP sockets there. there. Um, WebSockets are a socket product, uh, bi-directional socket protocol based on HTTP which is generally pretty nice because it gives you all that cool HTTP tool. It's like it works in Nginx, um, which can like get you um, your certificates and whatnot. Um, and you can use proxies and anything else. Um, so uh, I was interested in using that anyway. Drawfile will probably switch to that wholesale at some point. It doesn't currently yet. But um, the downside here is you also have to implement that server side since it's not raw TCP sockets. If you need raw TCP sockets, there's the mscript and TCP emulation. Um, this from um, goes from like your regular application, turns it into WebSockets. Um, you set up a proxy server that will accept those WebSockets, which will then go to the raw TCP socket again. So you have like a proxy in the middle that's generic. And so you don't need to write any extra code for it. Don't know how well this works because I didn't try it because I wanted WebSockets anyway, but this exists. Yes. Yes, but that's not related to the sockets. Um, it's a drop file has um, drop file's netcode is a normal rollback netcode like you have in games. So if there's a conflict, it rolls back and plays it back. Um, one gotcha you have to watch out with that you don't in uh, your desktop application is course. Course is cross origin resource sharing. Basically, if you used any haven't done any JavaScript front end work, you use this. Set some headers, then it works. Um, another gotcha that probably doesn't matter for you, um, if you on HTTPS, you can only call out to HTTPS or like to secured sites, which also includes WebSockets. 
What's, what that's relevant for is if your users have something on a non-secured endpoint, like a Raspberry Pi sitting in the corner, then they're going to complain that they can't connect to it. So just something to be aware of. And the browser gives awful error messages for this. Like if, if your WebSocket can't connect because it's not HTTPS, you just get no error in Chromium at all. And Firefox actually tells you what the error was. But in Chromium, you just get who oh, connection was closed. And that gets you sockets. Any other questions before multi-threading gets even deeper into techie stuff? OK. I'm going to take a drink. Right, multi-threading. Yes. When you want to go back to files, so you can do files that are saved on the browser, so locally. But have you looked into like making something really persistent, like uh, having a database somewhere, and then users can create an account and log in from different browsers and still get the projects? Oh, not um, I mean, if they want to host, a, they can already host a canvas somewhere. So if they want a persistent canvas, the server supports that, yes. But um, their settings, a cloud settings would be nice, um, just something that takes storage and means users have to log in maybe someday, but it also requires, like maybe something users can pay for. Right now they can't pay for it, it's all free, so. So multi-threading. Um, as I said, JavaScript doesn't have um, doesn't have uh, threads at all, but mscripten provides you with pthreads emulation. So you get a normal pthreads um, API with like all like the, the threading primitives and the, the synchronization primitives you would expect, which on top of like the Qt primitives also work like you would expect, like qthread, qsemaphore, qmutex. Although side note on that, maybe like do some performance measurements on that if you use those because Drawfall got like a massive speed up from switching from the Qt mutex to just wrapping critical section on Windows. They're really slow there, but whatever, side note. Um, however, like while it's a pthreads API, the implementation is super different from anything you would have on a desktop or mobile platform, like on a nat native platform. Um, so you have to probably do some re-architecting anyway. What they use under the hood is web workers. Um, web workers let you run separate processes in the browser that are effectively on a different thread, um, and they're a bit more limited in what they can do. But most things that your native application wants to do probably works fine there. The primary thing that's different about them than native threads is that they have huge overhead with regards to synchronization and task switching. So um, if your application does like um, wants to do like um, CPU bound work and do it on like eight threads and just uses a key or something, it's probably going to end up slower just from the switching overhead. Um, if you want to run CPU bound stuff in the background so you don't block the main thread and make the browser extremely upset at you because the main thread is not yours, it's the browser's, um, that's like worth it. So Drawpile on desktop, Drawpile renders like on eight threads or however many cores we have. Um, it renders the canvas in parallel. In the browser, it renders it on only one thread in the background because otherwise that's slower. Um, Another thing you can't do in web workers is use OpenGL. That's one of those um, one of those APIs that doesn't work on a web worker. Maybe you're not doing this anyway because it's really annoying to do OpenGL on threads and desktop anyway. Um, but if you really need it, um, mscripten gives you an interface to call OpenGL on the main thread, which is actually reasonably performant. The problem with that is is that you need to do special calls to do it. So either you have to re-architect your application, write a different backend for um, the browser, or you have to do macro soup to do, wrap all your OpenGL calls into calls into the main thread. But then they work. And the big thing is memory. Like as I said, web workers are processes; they're not threads, so they don't share memory by default, which is kind of the point of threads. Um, the way you get around this is with a shared ray buffer, as the name says. Um, it's shared between different processes. And that itself like doesn't have problems, um, but getting a shared array buffer is a bit involved. And it's not that it has gotchas, it's more like it consists entirely of gotchas. Um, since Spectre and Meltdown, um, the API has been locked down and can only be used if you um, fulfill certain prerequisites. For one, you need a secure context for the API to be available. What's a secure context? Um, basically means you need to serve your page over HTTPS. Um, even if you're 
if your application doesn't use the network at all, for some reason you still need to serve it over HTTPS, otherwise the browser says no, you don't get a shared array buffer. Again, this is probably not a problem for you because you have websites anyway. If you just want to self-host it on a Raspberry Pi in the corner, they're going to complain that it doesn't work because it's not HTTPS. Uh, luckily, localhost is also a uh, secure context, so you don't need to create local certificates. The next thing you need for it to work is cross-origin isolation. Um, to get cross-origin isolation, you use corp headers. Um, corp is not course. Course is the thing I talked about before, cross-origin resource sharing. Corp is cross-origin resource policy. What this means is you set the headers, cross-origin resource policy, same site, cross-origin alternate policy, same origin, and cross-origin emitter policy require corp. I tried understanding what these do. Um, not Still not sure what they do. They sure doesn't don't restrict anything that Dropout wants to do, and it wants to do weird things like connect to random other websites, web sockets to give you multiplayer on your own server. That works fine. So not sure, I don't know, maybe it restricts like loading malicious ads or something, but your free software probably doesn't that do that anyway. Um, those you do need to set on localhost. So if you just want, to, if you just want to think you can just host your application like python mhdp.server, no, you have to set these headers, which is a bit annoying. Next thing, um, shared array buffers need a maximum memory amount that you give to it. Normally, you do this by passing um, dash s maximum memory to your m script and linker flags, and you probably pass equals four gigabytes to it because why would you want less memory that just makes your application run out of memory faster. The problem here is that Safari exists. Um, so the way this works, um, how you get this memory buffer is through the webassembly.memory class. The constructor looks like this. Um, it takes an initial amount of memory. Qt sets this to 50 megabytes, I think, by default. Maximum is what mscript and just puts the stuff uh, you pass to it during link time, uh, just sticks it in there and shared is a Boolean true or false. The maximum parameter is documented as being a hint to the browser engine um, how much memory your uh, shared array buffer should be able to grow to. Safari can't take a hint. Um, what it does, it, it just attempts to allocate that amount of memory immediately, which unlike an iPad and iPhone, is just gonna say no and crash. <sighs> so, Okay, the way you can get around this, well, you can lower the maximum amount of memory your application uses, but for one, that sucks for all the platforms, like users with normal browsers, then have less memory and gonna run out of memory faster. And second, you don't know how me much memory the device will actually give you, because it's not like that's documented, it's just whatever it feels like. Um, so what you probably actually want to do is like, Take care of allocating the memory yourself. Try to allocate four gigabytes. If that doesn't work, back off. Use less memory until you get um, a buffer that actually works. Then pass that to mscripten uh, to use during init initialization. That took a very long time to figure out because that sure isn't documented. Um, and has a problem, namely mscripten also generates um, this function, get heap max, where it puts the maximum amount of memory just right in there into the code, which is gonna be the wrong amount. So you probably want to create a libjs and override this get heap max function there to actually return the proper amount of memory. Not sure what happens if you don't do that. Like if you're gonna run out of memory, you're gonna run out of memory. So I'm not sure if it actually matters that that returns the proper value, but maybe it makes your application run out of memory not as fast if it's proper because mscripten won't try to like grow your memory buffer beyond what it can grow to. Um, Next problem, if you refresh in Safari, it doesn't free your memory buffer from the previous load. So the second time you try to acquire a memory buffer, you just don't get one because Safari is like, wow, you already have this giant memory buffer in the previous page load that you can't reach anymore. And since you can't reach it, you can't free it. You can't do anything. It's not like Safari gives you an option to call the GC. So all you can do is tell the user, hey, you refreshed the page and you don't have enough memory. So close the browser, open it again, and it'll work again. Okay, and after all that, you get multi-threading. And it actually works pretty good. Um, at least on devices that are like new enough to have shared array buffer, again, old iPads, for example, too old, don't get it. Any questions here? Okay, then something more lighthearted. 
Pressure sensitive fence. So this is a pressure sensitive pen. You use it on a drawing tablet. When you press harder, your application gets reported more pressure. So that's like a value between 0% and 100%. Um, fancier tablet pens also like report how the pen is angled or how it's rotated. This pen doesn't, but they support it. Um, the browser does support these pen events through pointer events. So there's like pointer down, pointer move, pointer up. And there is the uh, pointer type pin, which has pressure and angle and azimuth, whatever that is, and a bunch of different um, properties that you would expect. Um, that's supported on most browsers. As I said, it's not supported on Firefox on Linux, but pretty much any other browser, um, and Chromium all across the board. Um, and if you know Windows um, browsers, they only support Windows Ink, not WinTab. Won't get into that. Just if you know what that is, you know what, what that's about now. And in Qt, those turn into mostly normal Qtablet events, um, at least since Qt 6.6.3, because that's when I implemented it and sent them a patch. If you need it on an earlier version, I'm sure you can just backport that patch. It's not that crazy. Um, and even though like that's pretty simple, there's still plenty of gotchas, because of course, it's tablet pens. They're, the, the drivers are all awful, and the handling in most operating systems all look terrible. So this just turns into a comedy of errors. Um, first, there's like a weird touch event conflict. Um, when your user presses on the screen and then brings the tablet pen near, um, the pointer move event from the pen overrides the touch event, but you don't get a touch cancel. So Qt thinks that the user is holding their finger down on the tablet for all eternity. And they will, they, the browser will never emit like a, a finger removed event ever. So the finger will stay there and all your future touch events will turn into complete mess. The user keeps accumulating fingers. Everything is terrible and nothing works anymore. Um, okay, the way to solve this is when you get like a pen event, just cancel all touch events because that's what the browser does under the hood anyway. Um, I haven't managed to like contribute this back to Qt, but there's a patch in Dropout Source G that does exactly that, just throws away all the, all the fingers that are down when a pen event comes in. The next gotcha, erasers. Um, my tablet pen again doesn't, but some tablet pens in addition to the regular pen tip have another tip on the end for an eraser. And so um, in a normal application on desktop, when you bring your pen near to the tablet, um, it gives you a tablet interproximity event in Qt, which tells you which tip was brought near. And so your application can react to that. So when you get, um, when the eraser is brought near, you can switch to the eraser tool, for example. And then when the other side is brought back, you switch to the regular pen tool again. That doesn't happen with browser. It just, the pointer events don't have a concept of pen was brought near. So you don't get these events ever. Um, what you get instead is once the pen is actually pressed down, you can look at the button that was pressed and that tells you which side of the pen was pressed down. So the regular tip is a left click or button one, and the other side is a Qt task button, which is button five. But that's like very different UI wise because you can't switch tools when the pen is brought near anymore. You can only do something once it's pressed down because otherwise no button is pressed. So what do you do? Do you just like when the pen is down, do you like switch the UI to the eraser and then when it's lifted up, switch back and flickers back and forth? That would be really annoying. Um, what Dropout does, it just, if you use the eraser, it just uses the current brush to erase, and that's it. It doesn't switch the UI in any way, um, which is what other applications I've seen do too. They don't try to switch to a different tool during it. Next gotcha, there's more. Um, Apple pins. Um, this scientific curve shows you how a normal tablet pen works. When you press very lightly, you get close to 0% pressure. When you press hard, you get 100% pressure, like you would expect. This curve looks different for an Apple Pen. Um, when you press hard, you get barely any pressure. Once you, the user presses so hard, it pierces the screen, you're at about halfway. And once you're at about the pressure of a neutron star, you're getting close to 100%. Which means like the user will think, oh, the, the, the application isn't recognizing my pen because it thinks the user is pressing super daintily and to get like this tiniest pen that's like super transparent and nothing works, okay. The way you solve this is pretty obvious. You set the global pressure curve to something stupidly uh, steep when the user is using an Apple Pen. Problem here, you're in the browser. The browser sure doesn't tell you when the user is using an Apple Pen. Um, okay, so the way you figure this out, and that's gonna make like every uh, web developer cringe, is you look at the user agent. 
Um, <laughs> and that's fine, though, because the only thing you want to know is, OK, is the user using an iPad or an iPhone? And those people can't change their user agent anyway, so it's OK. And there's plenty of JavaScript libraries that will tell you this. And then chances are, when they're using a device like this, they're either using an Apple Pen or something compatible with it. So then you switch the pressure curve to something stupid. Next one, um, handwriting detection. On Windows, there's this awesome panel. It's the handwriting detection panel. Um, you can write text into it, and then it fails to detect what you wrote into it. Um, it's great. It's very nostalgic. It's like using an Apple Newton or something. Um, the problem is that whenever you press your pen on the window in the browser, like your application window in the browser, this shows up. It doesn't work. Like You can't use it to like actually input handwriting. It just shows up to annoy you. Um, OK, so the obvious answer for this, well, OK, the user just has their computer misconfigured. They should turn off handwriting recognition. OK, let's look at the setting that is used to turn this off. Has, OK, when I tap the text field with my pen, use handwriting to input text. And the default setting is when the keyboard isn't attached. So you would expect that on a laptop that has a keyboard pretty firmly attached, you wouldn't get handwriting input. No. <laughs> It just shows up anyway. As far as I can tell, the default option that rambles about keyboards just means on. The other option, only in tablet mode, I don't know what tablet mode is, but I guess my computer isn't in it, because that means off. Which means your user has no chance of setting this correctly, because neither of the options makes sense. OK, so work around it some other way. I reported it to Qt. They said it's fixed in Qt 6.7. I don't believe them, because they didn't fix what caused it. So not sure. I haven't managed to try this out yet because I have to like adjust my patches again. But how I actually fix it is um, Qt sets content editable true on like the canvas element, which they do to get keyboard events on it, um, which in turn makes Windows think, oh, you want handwriting panel on this awesome uh, canvas. Um, the way I fixed it is deleted that and replaced it with tab index 1. What tab indexes have to do with keyboard events, I'm not sure. But when you set them to negative 1, you get keyboard inputs. And that works fine. Again, it's a patch. Um, and after all that mess, you get pressure sensitive pen support. OK, so done. All right. Next up, oh, maybe is there any questions about all this guff? OK, then. Rust. As I said, Rust is an overhyped programming language. Um, it's kind of neat. It gets you contributors because it's cool and hype, but otherwise, it's fine. Um, Drawpile used it in the client for some stuff like uh, writing Photoshop files because it's pretty. It's nicer than C uh, for reasons for stuff like that because it has nicer interfaces. Supposedly, Rust is good at WebAssembly. I don't think it's good at this kind of WebAssembly. Like maybe it's good if you want to make your like your React application go fast, but if you want to use it for a desktop application, I have found it to not be very good. Um, so Rust has like two platforms for WebAssembly, or maybe more. I'm not sure, but like I found these two. Um, one of them has mscript in the name, so you think, hey, we'll use that one. It's got mscript. No, um, that just gets you bit rot because that platform doesn't work. As far as I can tell, like that's the only information I can find about it. It doesn't work, and it's dead. So what you use instead is WASM32 unknown unknown, which means you don't get any of the cool mscript and runtime stuff in Rust. But that's OK, because Rust has an OK standard library. And if you really need to call out to uh, browser APIs, you can just call to C and do it from there. OK. Then you build your Rust code as a static library. You try to link it together with your code, and that doesn't work. Because Rust thinks that WebAssembly is a single-threaded platform. And your code uses threads. And so your code is built with pthreads. And uh, MScript, uh, though the Rust code is not, so they won't link together, just like if you built your own code without pthreads and tried to link it with a pthreads uh, Qt. OK, that's a bit of a problem. Um, you can't teach Rust that, uh, that like threads exist on MScript. And it just doesn't have a concept of that. I looked into it. I tried patching around on the Rust compiler, gave up because it's a bit more involved. But you can get the code to compile in a way that is compatible by passing dash c target feature plus atomics plus bulk memory to your uh, Rust flags. That'll compile the code with uh, the necessary stuff that pthreads would also set, like the dash pthreads flag would also set. And that makes the Rust code link with your code. Problem, 
it then doesn't make the Rust code link with the standard library anymore because the standard library is built without threads. Okay, the way you fix that is you pass dash z build std core std alloc proc macro panic aboard to um, the cargo flags, not the Rust flags. When you do this, you build your own version of the Rust standard library, and then it will link together. And then it works, maybe. Because as I said, Rust still thinks this is a thing of Radit platform. So not sure if you're like, if you call it like a Rust function from like multiple threads, if it's gonna like screw up some global state or something, not sure. Um, it's also only available in like nightly Rust. So it's like massively unstable and someone's probably gonna break it because you're gonna be the only person in the universe that does this nonsense. Um, don't blame me if it breaks because I gave up on it and just removed it again, just took drop out of the uh, took rust out of the dropout client again because it was too much of a mess um, it still uses rust for like command line tools and maybe we'll use it for like the server because rust is kind of neat for that with like its memory safety and whatnot and that's stuff that doesn't need to run in the browser but for the browser client I just took it out and uh, because I didn't trust it if you know better than me like maybe rust is actually as awesome as the whole internet seems to say and it's actually super good at it and i'm just too dumb to get it working like feel free to correct me but as far as i could find like this is the situation if you want to link it together with m script and code but once with all that like with those weird flags and all that you get rust or like maybe not i don't know um you do you and that's it that's this talk <laughs> thanks for listening thank you